you know, I'm just an open book. I'm just going to come up here, be myself, and share some things that God's been pouring into my heart. Um, you know, I, I'm not the type that, like, if somebody told me what I need to preach on, that I could do that. Um, I need to just preach what's happening in here, you know. And I think that many times that what is happening in here, the things that God is working on, are usually an inclination as to what we're supposed to be chasing after in life. And we kind of ignore some of those natural feelings because it, it's very um, normal in our society today to compare ourselves to others. It's very easy to look around and say, well, look at their gift or look at the way they talk or look at how they do that thing. And there are things that we can glean from other people. There, there's nothing wrong with that. But many times we forget that being ourselves is the most powerful thing that we can be. Because the things burning on the inside of each person, though unique, is really what makes it all so special, is that that's how God designed us to be, that we each sometimes have something different burning in our hearts. And that's the church. When the church then comes together with all these people burning for different things, it becomes a very powerful place. He didn't try to create a church where everybody looked the same and acted the same. We're supposed to bring our own personality and character and flair to this thing called the church. And so I'm just going to bring my flair today, and hopefully you like my flair. If you don't, then you can come back next week, and um, somebody else will be up here. Okay, so there is... I'll pray really quick. Father God, I just thank you for this opportunity to be in your house, to be with your people. And I pray, God, that we would be changed in your presence, not because of anything wise I have to say, but because your spirit is here. It's moving in our midst, and it's coming and bringing clarity. It's bringing wisdom. It's bringing revelation today in Jesus' name. Amen. So there is a culture war going on. I don't think you have to look very far to find it. There's many battles being fought in many different areas of our culture and society. But they all kind of have a root. And many people, and it, you know, when I, when I say these things, I'm talking about all of us, not like, I'm not like saying you guys. <laughs> but many of us, um, we can look at it and we could say it's really an attack on Christianity or the church. And we could say that society is trying to pull Christianity out of it. You know, it's trying to get rid of it. But really, it's a much deeper battle that's going on. It's not against Christianity, say, or the church. It's actually against God himself. What, what society is trying to do is they're trying to remove him, trying to remove that he ever was or existed or that he has anything to do with life today or life ever, that this is all just, you know, kids are taught in school that this is all just random happenstance, that this just happened because of some evolutionary processes that happened in the world. And there was nobody that had forethought to think how it was going to be, but that it all just is, and we're all just dealing with how it is. But there is someone. It talks about it in John chapter 1. It talks about the Word, and it says that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. And this word, word, not to be confused, is logos. And this word also has a much deeper and bigger meaning, meaning the divine order of God's creation. That God speaks and divine things, order happens and creativity happens. And then it comes into order or like laws and things that govern it happen. So what we're talking about is in Genesis 1 and in John 1, we're talking about the creation process. And it's very important that God not be removed from this process because design dictates purpose every time. Design always dictates something's function, what it is supposed to naturally do. And this is why I have these tools. 
which I am not amazing at using. I'm the grunt guy, you know? I do all the grunt work, carry the heavy objects, maybe hit a couple nails. My father-in-law, he's the mastermind. He just helped me put in a water heater the other day. My job was to carry it to where it needed to go. <laughs> and then to help him lift it into the awkward room I said we were going to install it in. And then he did all the hard work, and I just handed him stuff, you know, as he needed it. So that's my function in, in that, you know, uh, in that space is I'm the grunt guy. But I know how to swing one of these. Now, this hammer looks wildly different than the first objects people used to hammer things. I'm pretty sure they probably just picked up a rock or something and just started banging on things with it. And that's what Adam and Eve, you know, they didn't have machinery that could manufacture a hammer like this. But this hammer looks the way it does for a very specific reason. It has many features about it. Some of these features are there's like little indentations on the end. And this is to find grip on whatever it hits so it doesn't slip off. It's got this back that goes from wider to smaller so that different sized nails you can grip and rip them out. And this whole thing comes to a point so that you can take it and wedge it in between two pieces of wood or different objects, maybe even hammer it with another hammer into something and pry them apart. It also has weight in different places, specifically so that it swings so that it can have the maximum amount of impact on whatever you're hitting it with. This hammer was very specifically designed to hit nails. This was not designed to hit screws. Have you ever tried to hit a screw with a hammer? It doesn't go in, it just breaks in half. That's what happens. That's what this guy's for. Don't you think the guys that were building houses with this screwdriver had to look like Popeye the Sailor Man? Their forearms had to be humongous. I mean, anytime I'm putting together IKEA furniture with a hand screwdriver, by the end of it, my forearms and my fingertips are aching. So, we improved upon this design. We improved upon it with this. Now this has a lot of very specific features too. It can go at different speeds. Have you ever accidentally had it at the highest speed and you go to put a drywall screw in or something and it just goes straight through the drywall? You're supposed to change those settings, you know, young people that don't know how to use one of these. You're supposed to twist this level one all the way back to one. And then that's the weakest setting. And it'll go real slow. So, you know, if it's on the highest setting, whoop, it'll go all the way in. So that was designed. It's designed to go in forwards and backwards. That's amazing. It's got a little light on the end. So when you're in dark places, which you typically are, you can see what you're doing right in front of you. It also has a magnetic tip because dropping screws down cracks is my least favorite thing. Besides plumbing. Every time you're doing something with plumbing, you're in a very tight space, and I hit my head every time. And you're already frustrated that the wrench you were holding dropped on your face while you were trying to tighten the faucet. And now you're, you're angry, so then you try to get out from under the sink, and you hit your head on the sink. Now you just give up and you hire somebody to do this stuff because you're just the grunt guy, and you don't really know how to do any of it. Those tools were very specifically designed. This drill cannot put in a nail, and this hammer cannot put in a screw. And there's many other tools that are specifically designed for specific things. So design dictates purpose. You would not want to use one of these on things it was not designed to be used on. And if you did, you just end up making a mess of things. You just end up breaking things. We'll get to more of that later. So what is our design? I think that's the big question. How did God design us? How am I supposed to be used by God? Just like an, an instrument or a tool. How does he desire to use me? And we find this in the very beginning. When, when God is talking about creating creation, it's also a very neat moment, that, that little line that says, and God saw that it was good. That's what any designer does. When they've refined something to the point that it's how they intended it to be, he says, this is good. I'm done now. 
Have you ever met somebody that's like constantly working on a painting or constantly working on something? I have a friend who made a sculpture and he's been working on it on seven or eight years now. And he just kind of keeps it in a room in his house. And he goes back to it when he has time or when he's um, regained some like fire to work on it. You know, sometimes you're even working on something and you kind of lose the flame. And then it comes back at some point and you want to work on it again. An artist takes time to create what is in their mind that they wanted to create. They want it to be the way that they are intending for it to be so that it can do what they're intending it to do. And for a piece of art, it's that it be perceived as beautiful or that it you know, uh, inspire the person seeing it in some way. But tools are in that way too. And so at the very beginning, the very first time God mentions us, in Genesis 1, 26, it says, and then God said, let us make human beings in our image to be like us. They will reign over the fish in the sea, the birds in the air, the livestock, all the wild animals of the earth, and the small animals that scurry along the ground. So God says a profound statement right here about our design, which ultimately is our purpose. He says, let us make human beings in our image, to be like us. Our purpose is to be like God. That is our purpose. That is what he made us to do. That does not mean that we are God. Because the very next sentence, and I do want to mention this, because there are some new age ideas that we are all God, or a part of God, or that we are extensions of him in a more profound way than we really are. So let me be clear that the first thing God says is let them be like us. But the second thing he says is he puts dominion around that. He says, this is what you will rule over, just so you know. I'm going to rule over everything. You're going to rule over this section here. And it says, they will reign over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and the livestock and all the wild animals on earth and all the small animals that scurry along the ground. It talks more about that in Genesis, where our dominion is, and God says, be fruitful and multiply, and he gives us instructions on tending the garden. So God, first of all, says, let us make them like us, but then let us give them dominion over a much smaller section of the earth and all the things. So the first thing God does is defines us, gives us purpose, and then points us in the direction of the thing that we are supposed to be like him in. And that is to have dominion. That is to rule over things. And we'll get more to that later. So then we have to ask the question, what is God like? What does he do? What are his characteristics? If I am to be like him, then what does, what is God like? And the first thing is that God is a creator. That's the very first thing that I want to talk about. God is a creator, which means that we are creators. Have you ever, like, met somebody and they've got, like, a vibe about them? Yes? No? Maybe? Everybody kind of carries, we call it a vibe, we call it a spirit, we call, some. they just have something on them. You know, like the really hyper ones, the really talkative ones. There's many different characteristics. I've got a few different like names, and don't look at the person if they're sitting next to you, if they're one of these things. Have you ever heard someone described as a real downer? Anybody know a real downer? They're always disappointed about something. Every time you hang out with them, they just talk about all their problems. Never anything positive. They carry a spirit about them. It's an energy. It's a whatever you want to call it. They just have something around them that they exude that you experience every time you're around them. A real downer. Bull in a china shop. Anybody know a person like that? You know, they want to talk about politics at every gathering. They don't really care about what they say. They just kind of say whatever. Just whatever comes to their mind, they just let it come out. Bull in a china shop. The me monster. That, that's a comedian reference, but the me monster always wants to talk about themselves. You know, every time I meet a new person, I ask them two questions. What do you do? 
as in like if you're young, school or you know whatever, or if you're older, do you have a job? What do you do? And then number two, do you have any hobbies? Because I want to learn about people. You know, it's extremely rare. I would say less than 10% of the time that anyone reciprocates those questions. Now, don't feel bad for me. <laughs> the point is, is that there's many me monsters in the world. Actually, I could get on a total soapbox about how social media has created the most narcissistic generations in the world. Everybody just wants to think about themselves all the time. Look what I'm doing. Look what I'm eating. Look what I think about this. Hopefully you love all of my opinions that I'm going to spray upon everyone's posts that they make. I don't care. My job is to seek first the kingdom of God, and every spiritual blessing will be poured upon me, and I will live out my days in peace, joy, and happiness. And nobody can take that from me. Nobody can steal it with their opinions or how they think things need to go. I'll move on from that. So then we have to ask, what if God is, um, if we are supposed to be like God, what should be coming out of my life? What kinds of things should be the evidence that I am like him? And this is found in Galatians chapter 5. I think I quote the scripture every time I preach. But it's just, it's number one. Galatians 5, through 23, it says, But the Holy Spirit, which is God, produces this kind of fruit or this kind of evidence with the things that he does. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. I would say that's a really long list of, a, of really amazing things that I fall short of every single day. Now, the opposite of that, it says in the previous verses, in verse 19, it says, but the spirit of sin, or this could also be interpreted as just a spirit that is not of God, any spirit that is not his spirit, produces these things. It says the results are very clear. Sexual immorality, impurity, lustful pleasures, idolatry, sorcery, hostility, quarreling, just fighting with people, jealousy, that's happening everywhere, all over the internet. Outbursts of anger, selfish ambition, dissension, division, envy, drunkenness, wild parties, and other sins like these. I would say that I see more of the spirit of sin in the world today than I do the spirit of God being on display. I would say that I see more unforgiveness than forgiveness. And so we have to ask, what fruit is coming from my life that is evidence that I am like God? And if I was designed, like this hammer, to be like him, then I should look and act like this hammer. But the problem is, when I have this other stuff coming from my life, I'm using the tool the wrong way. And I end up breaking things. When we start walking in envy and strife and drunkenness and jealousy and outbursts of anger, all of a sudden we start, instead of building bridges with this hammer, we start tearing them down. Instead of fixing things, we end up breaking them. Or are you using this on the wrong thing? This is supposed to be used on nails. Do you think I should fix my iPad or type on my keyboard with this? Yes. <laughs> I'm going to break it. I'm going to break something that wasn't intended to be used with this. And we break our relationships with people. And we break our ability, we ruin our ability to show people who God is, which is kind of the whole point. He needed to create more people like himself so that they could be evidence of who he was. But when the wrong fruit is coming from my life, that evidence isn't there. They, they, they aren't seeing God. They're seeing everything that's not God. And it's God that changes people. It's not my good behavior. It's when they see his character in my life that all of a sudden they are inspired to think there is something greater than the spirit of the world that I see all around me. There's something better than what I'm seeing all around me. 
So number one, God is a creator. And we create things by our actions and our words. We are creators. Those people I talked about, the me monster, the real downer, the bull in the china shop, they create that atmosphere with their words and with their actions. And we create and carry that spirit with us and it affects the space we're in. You ever like intentionally not invite somebody to a party or a get together? Because you're like, oh, they're really going to bring down the mood, you know? Because they bring a certain energy with them, a certain spirit, a certain fruit in their life. And I know that I want to be the bearer of the Jesus fruit, the good fruit. I want when people, when they're around me, to feel his love and acceptance. I want people to know that he's faithful, so I need to be faithful to them. I need to be true to my word. So I can be an example of how he's true to his word. I'm supposed to be a mere image of him. Sorry, let me find my place. You know, in Proverbs chapter 18, verse 21, it says, The tongue can bring death or life, and those who love to talk will reap the consequences. I've heard a proverb that basically it's not that eloquent, but with more words comes more room for error. Now, if you like to talk, that's totally fine. The scripture's really just talking about that you have the power of life and death right here. You can either bring life into people's lives or you can bring death, which that is just to bring goodness and life and wholeness into them, or you can bring destruction. Has everyone, anybody ever been destroyed by words someone has said to them? I mean, it sticks with you for a long time. It takes a long time to pick up the hammer of love and graciousness and all these things and rebuild what gets torn down in moments with the words that we speak. We can say something in a moment that God has been trying to build up in someone and we can rip it down with just a couple words. We have power because we are made in his image. When you're made in his image, you're made to be a creator like he's a creator. Therefore, you carry the power of God in your words, just like his word created everything you see. Our words are not quite as powerful. We'll talk about that later. But they do have power. Our words and our actions, they have more power than we give them credit for. And we need to use them for the right things. So what are three ways, and, and this is just three ways because I think there's a lot of ways, but I just tried to narrow this down because I only have a certain amount of time, that we can better fulfill our purpose. Again, our purpose, I just want to keep coming back to design dictates purpose, and I was designed to be like God. Therefore, when I'm not being like God, I'm not doing what I was designed to do. Everybody wants, you know, the most common question, that anyone will ask in their life and keep coming back to, what is the meaning of all of this? This is the answer to that question. The meaning is to be like him. And when we're like him, man, life is beautiful. When we can walk in these things, when we can walk in the fruits of the Spirit, man, life is so enjoyable. It's enjoyable to be around people. It's enjoyable to be alive. That's what I want. I want to wake up every day looking forward to the day, looking forward to what God wants to do that day. But many times we become discouraged and disheartened because we're walking in the wrong thing. We're being used in the wrong way. And you know, if you use something wrong for a long time, you get pretty burnt out. You burn up the engine. If I keep trying to use this uh, battery drill to break through concrete, it's going to run out of juice pretty quick. I need the corded version, the hammer drill. I, I need the big one. And so we can't be burning ourselves out walking in the spirit of the world. Because when we walk in the spirit of God, he gives us strength and he renews us day by day. And we can go walk through anything. One of my favorite analogies in the Bible is Peter walking on the water. You know, it doesn't say that Jesus calmed the storm. It doesn't say that it was bright and sunny and there was, you know, seagulls chirping. It says that the storm was raging. And Jesus asked Peter to come out onto the water. And it didn't say that God gave him supernatural strength to not drown while he swam to Jesus. 
It says that he walked on top of it. You know, when you're walking in the Spirit of God, circumstances don't change. The world doesn't change. It doesn't mean bad things don't happen. It doesn't mean that there's not hardship in life. It just means that instead of swimming in it, you're going to be walking on top of it. You're walking above it. And many times, that's a mindset. It doesn't change many things in the physical sometimes. Sometimes it just changes how you see the thing that you're going through. And so if I want to truly walk in the Spirit of God, wow, it elevates me above the circumstances of the world. Again, not to get out of the storm. Sometimes it's to walk on top of it, and then you can start pulling people out of the water and having them walk with you on the water. And you're all just going to be looking down, looking at this, looking at all these waves and just thinking, wow, it's pretty rough down there. I got to get more people up here. That's really what evangelism is. We're walking above the mess of the world. And we, you, you look down, you're like, they're all struggling. I got to get them out of that water. I got to pull them to safety. I got to teach them how to walk like they were designed to walk and not going against what God intended for them, for them. So what are three digestible, easy things that you can hopefully grab a hold of and that we can walk out these doors and actually change in our lives? One is that we have to take our dominion. And that, that's preached in many different ways, in many different contexts, on different things that you'll get by having dominion. But really, I'm just talking about this scripture right here. In 1 John chapter 4, verse 4, it says, But you belong to God, my dear children. You have already won a victory over these people, because the Spirit who lives in you is greater than the Spirit who lives in the world. You know, have you ever heard the phrase, um, man, it's only going to get worse. Man, the world's going to hell in a handbasket. I don't like phrases like that. Because it discounts the power of God, that the power of God has on the earth to change the earth. This scripture says that greater is he that is in me. The spirit that is in me is greater than the spirit in the world. So it isn't that I just continue walking and life's just going to continue getting worse and the world's just going to continue to decline. If I would get myself out into the world, then I would change it. Because the spirit in me is greater than the spirit in the world. We have to stop acting like all oh, bad things are just going to keep happening, which, again, like I said, it's not that circumstances change sometimes. But we have the power, because we are creators like God, to go and create a different culture, to go and create a different atmosphere. We're not just supposed to hide back from it and be scared of the darkness. Well, I don't want it to negatively impact me. Negatively impact you? You're supposed to negatively impact it. We, we seem to have more faith in the darkness than we have in the light. We need to believe that the spirit that God gave me can overcome every spirit that's in the world. So we need to take our dominion and stop shying away from the world. We need to go and change the world. I don't care if that means we're supposed to become politicians or if we're supposed to become movie directors. I don't know what it's supposed to mean that we're supposed to become, but we're supposed to go and change the cultures of the world. So we need to take our dominion. We also need to align our thoughts and our words with the Word of God. Very common phrases. Things are never going to change. I can't take this anymore. These words render us powerless. It says in Philippians chapter 4, For I can do everything through Christ who strengthens me. There's nothing that will bring me down because I have the Spirit of God on the inside of me. I can walk through any hardship. I can walk through any situation. I, I can have any conversation with any person and walk out of it on the other side. I can do that. Not because of me, but because the Spirit of God lives on the inside of me. So don't say things that render you powerless. Don't give your power over to other things. You know, something I'm still working on as a parent is using fear to manage kids. 
That's something that you're just used to doing. You're just used to saying, oh, if you do that again, so help me. What a phrase. <laughs> so help me. Like, it's just like open-ended so that they just don't know what you're going to do. You know, it's just like you have no idea. You can't even imagine what I'll do to you. But that phrase, <laughs> use that hammer, but that phrase says that if you push my buttons anymore, all of a sudden I'm not going to be walking in the spirit of God anymore. I'm going to walk in the spirit of the flesh. And when I walk in the spirit of the flesh, who knows what's going to happen? But when I say that phrase, I'm trying to use fear to control. It also says in the Bible that there is no fear in love. It says that, but it also is saying here that I can talk to my child. It doesn't matter how many times they scream at the top of their lungs in my car while I'm just trying to drive and get everyone there safely. It doesn't matter how many times they do it, the Spirit of God will give me grace to walk through that. If he doesn't, I have basically just handed over my power as a creator to the spirit of the world and said, you can use me now as a vessel for your doing instead of saying that I want to be a vessel used by God. I want to be a vessel that teaches my children how to walk in patience. Still fighting that battle. And the, and the last one, and I'll end with this. The last one is that we need to know where we end and where God begins. You know, God gave us dominion over a certain part, but he only gave us so much power. There's only so much we can do. The rest God does. The rest he takes care of. You know, God has been speaking to me a lot about, you know, the differences in people and how it's so powerful. You know, my, my wife and I are very different, but that's actually good. It's in our differences when we come together that we become stronger because it's all those differences that make us a whole person, that make us whole. We're, we're really not complete without other people. We're really not complete. I'm really not complete without my wife. I'm just part of what God intended. Because the very first thing God said, and I, I said this last time I preached, the very first thing he said when he you know, made man was, that guy shouldn't be alone. He needs a helper. He needs another part. He's missing something. And so I will say that we need to know where we end and where God fills in the gaps. And I'd say one of those things is, you know, in, say, my wife and I's relationship, you know, I kind of view myself, I think we both do, as like, I'm supposed to be the, the steady rock. I'm supposed to be uh, the physically stronger one, you know, to do the the grunt work. And that's that part of that relationship. But somewhere along the way, um, we've been tricked into thinking that we were supposed to be more in our relationship with God than we were really supposed to be. When we have a relationship with God, He actually, He's the rock. He's the constant one. We fluctuate. We go in and out. But He's there when we're feeling the weight of the world. And then Jesus, he says, well, come to me, all you who are heavy and burdened, and lay your burdens down at my feet. He's the rock. He's the one that we go to. Another thing, he's all of this, all this fruit of the Spirit. I can't produce that on my own. I can't produce endless amounts of patience. I can't produce endless amounts of forgiveness. I will say that holding a grudge feels right sometimes. It feels justified. But then he comes in, and all of a sudden he tears that apart. He says, no, you don't need to hold on to that. Let me carry that for you. Let me carry the weight of that sin, that thing that happened to you that you're carrying. I'll carry that. You need to let it go. Because we're not the strong one in the relationship with God. 
You're not intended to be the more capable, the wise one, the one with all the ideas. I loved what Helen Voss said this morning at Huddle. It's his plan, not our plan. He's the one with the plan. We're the executor of the plan. But somehow, sometimes we put ourselves in a position we weren't intended to be in as the planner, the strong one, the one that's supposed to carry all the weight. That's not our role. That's his role. And so how do we continue to find out what our purpose is? Well, we read the Bible. It's all in there. It tells us who he is and what he's all about, which tells us who we should be and what we should be all about. I want to chase after my purpose because I know ultimately if, if I, <laughs> my boss always says this, if you're a hammer, everything looks like a nail, which is his way of saying that some people just run in and just hit everything that looks like a, <laughs> the bull in the china shop. But I want to be who God intended me to be. And I want to do the function that he designed me to do because I don't want to be a hammer going around tearing down bridges. I want to be a hammer building them between people and the church, between myself and others, me and my kids, me and my wife. I want to be building bridges, stronger bridges all the time, bridges that can withstand the weight of time, the weight of struggle, the weight of heaviness and sorrow. I want to build bridges that can we can walk over in those heavy times. So if you will, just stand with me and we're going to pray.